this uh, uh, center we have here in Lexington, uh, we're lucky to have that uh, does a lot of really good work into trying to find ways to prevent, uh, cure, or, or improve the lives of people with or affected by dementia. And uh, you know, we like to say sometimes that you know, we're better known in Paris, France than we are in Paris, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. You're one of the most clinically active sites, meaning there's uh, uh, more activity of people being in clinical trials to try and find a cure or treatments for Alzheimer's here than uh, pretty much any other place in the world, uh, right here in Lexington, Kentucky. So I'm very uh, proud to be uh, be working uh, with the center and to have been there for, for four years. Um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your interest in this as well. And uh, you know the whole concept of dementia, memory, and aging, it's a huge concept. And I'm gonna try and just give you an overview with just a couple of things that pertain to that, you know, about 20, 30 minutes. So hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, one of the questions I, I often get is, you know, what what's normal uh, memory loss <coughs> with aging and, and what's not? You know, really significant memory loss is not normal aging. But, you know, there are some changes with memory. So what is that? Uh, another question I get is, you know, Alzheimer's versus dementia. What's the difference? Can you have one without the other? It turns out you can, which I'll tell you about. Uh, and then, you know, the, the conditions that we're increasingly recognizing that maybe are, are leading up to or may, might be a risk for developing Alzheimer's dementia later on, the, the mild cognitive impairment, <coughs> what we call pre-Alzheimer's disease. And of course, then when you hear all that, you're gonna go, well, what do I do? What do I do with this information? And we've got you covered. Um, See, this slide is not showing up. Uh, I'll move to this one. Characteristics of cognitive aging. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, the uh, American Medical Association uh, had a working group to really address this question of what is normal cognitive aging because uh, we've been so used to beating on our drum that memory loss with aging is not normal. You need to get it checked out. I think uh, you know, we might have gone a little bit far and kind of spooked a lot of people uh, and made people feel uncomfortable when they recognize that, yes, there are some changes with memory and thinking that happens to everyone you know, as we get older. Uh, there's a lot of variability. You know, some people remain as sharp as a tack to their 102nd birthday or later, uh, whereas you know, other people you know, succumb to <laughs> dementia and diseases. Uh, sometimes at, at, at shockingly early ages. Um, the fact is for most of us, uh, some cognitive abilities will decline, will be a little bit slower with some things as we get older, sometimes a little harder to remember the name of that person that we thought we knew so well, the tip of the tongue phenomenon, that, that happens in, in many people with, with some of the normal age-related changes. Um, there are some things that actually improve with aging, some mental capacities. There's something to be said for experience, knowledge, you know, basically uh, what we call, you know, crystallized knowledge, what you have amassed over a lifetime of experience, you gain wisdom. Uh, and that does help with real world day-to-day -day functioning. And, and in a way sort of uh, counteracts, you know, some of the age-related changes. So I know many older people who are a little bit uh, slower, for example, than someone who's younger, but that wisdom allows them to really function at a better level. They can spot, identify, already know how to deal with problems even faster because they've done it before, uh, even though they may be slower to work out new problems. Um, so aging changes, even some slowing down of thinking, doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. And even as I'll talk about you know, some of the risk factors that we have, we're increasingly recognizing early stages of the disease, medical conditions that might increase our risk of having the disease. And while those are very, very important, uh, I always reassure people, it doesn't inevitably, inevitably mean you will get the disease, but certainly it's a good idea to modify what we can modify. You know, some risk factors like our genetics, we can't change who your parents are. 
uh, these biologically parents, you can't change your early life upbringing experiences. You can't change the environment that you have lived in up to this time. You can change, you know, environment and education and other kind of healthy, engaging behaviors from this point onwards. But what's happened has happened. Um, we can change uh, how we treat our health. We can change our diet. We can change, you know, do we look for and identify problems with blood pressure, problems with high cholesterol. And these things uh, are recognized as uh, risk factors when they occur in midlife. So, you know, in your uh, 40s and 50s, you know, if you have problems with blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, that can be associated with an increased risk of having dementia in later life. Uh, of course, it would take a study decades long to prove that treating these conditions will then stop or prevent these problems many years later. We have every reason to believe that it probably would help to treat them. And certainly some good evidence that in a shorter time frame, they do seem to be helpful. But uh, you know, some people say, well, the link is not that well established. The thing is that you're not going to find too many people arguing that taking care of your health, treating these problems like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, can also lead to things like heart attacks and stroke. It's probably going to be a good idea anyway. And you might uh, reduce your risk for dementia at the same time. So these are you know, modifiable uh, risk factors. So how do I know if I have a problem? You know, I found a, a list of a few symptoms that kind of differentiate normal aging, not normal aging. Uh, you know, I mentioned slower to think, you may be hesitating, maybe being a little more impulsive, kind of the look before you leave phenomenon. Uh, but you know, the, the main thing, those symptoms on the left side, normal aging, a little bit of slowing down, things are a little bit more difficult. But what I don't see really there is can't, not being able to do it anymore. If you get to the point that you cannot do something significant anymore, that's a, a sign that it's not normal aging. So it's something that you were able to do and, and there's no other reason for this, but you just cannot do that anymore because of your thinking ability to remember, ability to focus. That doesn't mean this is dementia. That means this is not normal aging. There may be other medical conditions, for example, that can mimic dementia. We have something called pseudo-dementia. Sometimes stress can do it, uh, depression. Uh, many medical problems can affect memory and thinking. So we'll often, when someone comes to us with a concern about their memory, it will order a brain scan, it will order some blood tests, uh, checking thyroid function, vitamin B12 levels, liver kidney function, that kind of thing. So uh, not normal aging does not necessarily mean dementia. Now, uh, what are signs that maybe it is dementia? And this slide, I don't know if everyone can see it. I'll, I'll read it out, but quickly, you know, memory loss, but memory loss, it's enough to uh, affect your day-to-day -day activities. So here's someone trying to figure out you know, what day is it? What am I supposed to do today? Uh, post notes are all over the floor. Um, difficulty performing familiar tasks. And this gentleman's frying eggs, but he put the shells into the into the frying pan. So kind of got really mixed up there. Problems with language. Uh, maybe picked up her cat. Looks like it, uh, what do you call this dog? Trouble finding your way around or knowing what time it is. Impaired judgment. And I think this slide is you know, someone who's wearing. Uh, you know, slippers and a, and a, and a dress, but uh, not with the coat or boots or gloves up to cold. Um, troubles doing um, mental calculations, or abstract thinking or planning ahead. Um, you know, I think, uh, I feel like that might be coming on every time it gets around April time and we have to do tax returns. Uh, uh, but if it affects more day-to-day -day stuff, that could be a problem. Here's a lady who's misplaced her, her dress and put it in the fridge. Uh, mood, behavior changes, you know, that's actually something that's important to mention here and that uh, uh, problems that indicate maybe a brain problem or maybe an early and developing dementia, it's not just memory and thinking problems, but it can also be mood changes. Depression and anxiety are really, really common things across the board in all ages. 
But if it's a, a change, if someone develops problems like this and they never had these problems before, that's something concerning enough and worth getting checked out. You know, personality changes, um, and not being able to recognize what other people's emotions are. And last one, last but not least, the most common symptom with developing dementias was apathy, loss of initiative. So basically, more likely to just sit there and not get engaged, not get it, it started in activities. And that can lead to many other things. So dementia is basically, you know, the symptoms, the, the loss of function and not able to do things. And what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is the disease process in the brain. And uh, I'll show you a picture of uh, the two main pathologies we see in Alzheimer's disease. One on the right here is what tends to happen first, buildup of the amyloid protein. You might have heard about that. It's called amyloid or A-beta-42, the Alzheimer's protein. It's what starts first. And it tends to build up uh, you know, as early as midlife you know, when we're having those other risk factors like uh, the high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and also this buildup of uh, uh, amyloid protein starts around then. It gets more and more. Many people will have a little bit, so some people will have more than others. Uh, what tends to happen next, uh, before you ever even get dementia, is you know once you get a, a certain load, it seems, uh, of this amyloid protein, it starts to hurt the neurons, the nerve cells. Uh, now, this is a higher magnification over on the left here. It shows this kind of thorn-shaped um, uh, those are our uh, brain cells, uh, brain neuronal cells, and the, the, the black inside, that's a stain that's showing the buildup of a protein called tau protein. And when these nerve cells are sick or dying, this tau protein starts to build up. So you get the amyloid protein first, it builds up midlife. It doesn't seem to necessarily cause the dementia directly, but it's the first stepping stone. The next thing that happens is the tau protein builds up, the neurons get sick and start dying, and uh, then they uh, start to cause symptoms. Where does amyloid protein come from? It's a normal protein in the body. It's made on the surface of cells, and normally it's sort of recycled and gets kind of chopped up, put into the, the waste basket, which is the spinal fluid. So it kind of flows down into the spinal fluid and gets absorbed. But uh, in the disease state, the pathology is it doesn't flow off on down to the spinal fluid. It gets stuck in the brain and it seems to stress the brain out there. So if you look at this over a continuum, you've got preclinical, you know, from say midlife or earlier, uh, something called mild cognitive impairment or MCI. That's when, you know, memory or thinking problems start to become noticeable as a change. Something's different, something's wrong. And it may be due to early Alzheimer's disease, or maybe it's due to vascular disease, or what we call hardening of the arteries. People used to think that all dementia was hardening of the arteries uh, until you know, really just about 50 years ago. It turns out that they're right, that it's probably present in actually most dementias as well. So there are other things other than Alzheimer's that can affect uh, your thinking. But generally, mild cognitive impairment, even though there's a little bit of a problem, there's a change. It's not enough, it's not sufficient to really impact day-to-day -day activities. But then we get into dementia if it does get worse. And you can see here, you know, these arrows, there's different what we call trajectories. Some people will stay perfectly healthy their whole life. Some people have a little bit of, you know, um, uh, normal cognitive aging. That's the other green line underneath. Some people will develop mild cognitive impairment and sort of stay there, you know. So change in their later years, but it doesn't really start to continue to decline into, into dementia. And some people, unfortunately, will continue to decline more rapidly and have real problems. And that's what we hope to prevent. I mean, we, we'd like to get rid of the blue line, but really the red line is what we want to stop people from having. Well, how do we detect some of these problems? People will come in sometimes and say, well, I've got some memory troubles. Uh, we might do a test of memory and thinking this is an example of one of the tests that we do called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. It looks like you're going back to elementary school, join the dots, you know, copy a cube, draw a clock. My uh, first and second grade kids are doing all of this stuff uh, as well. Numbers, series, um, 
you know, subtracting sevens. So it looks like elementary school. It should be really easy, but you'd be surprised, you know, people who are still functioning at a very high level can struggle with some of these things. And that's how we can kind of clinically pick up uh, objectively if, if there are some uh, problems. Uh, most of these seem like they should be pretty easy. If you go and try and do it though, you know, sitting in front of a doctor, you know, with the stopwatch going, it, it can all of a sudden get a whole lot harder. Uh, we do offer free memory screens at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging. And we do those on Wednesdays and Thursday afternoons. So if anyone did have a concern or know of anyone who's concerned about their memory or thinking, uh, they can come in and get a, a free screen. So just back to, you know, so what is this process of, of you know, the pre-Alzheimer's disease, the buildup of the amyloid protein, does it mean I'm going to get dementia, what's small cognitive impairment? You know, if we look at this over the years, so this is a, a graph that shows, uh, you know, as we go from left to right, you know, uh, over time from younger to older, and from the bottom to top is how much of each kind of pathology or problem might be there. So the red line is buildup of the amyloid protein in the brain. So that starts early. And then later on, you know, the blue line happens, uh, which is buildup of the tau protein, those little thorn shaped black, black things in, in the brain cells I showed you. After that, if we do brain scans, we talked about if we see someone coming in with a problem, we might do a brain scan. We'll start to see a little bit of shrinking of brain tissue, actually. Uh, and it's only after that that people generally start to have complaints of memory problems. You know, they may notice themselves some mild memory problems, but not sufficient to really impact their day-to-day -day activities. And then it's even much later after that that people then develop dementia, where they might have problems with uh, real life day-to-day -day functioning. Some people have argued about, you know, well, sh if I've got mild uh, memory problems, or if I've even got you no know, no memory problems, but I have this Alzheimer's protein building up in my brain, or I have this tau protein building up, do do I even want to know? Is uh, you know, is there anything I can do? So uh, some people might argue for the head in the sand mentality. If there isn't anything you can do about it, I don't want to know. Just live your life blissfully. Well, there's something to be said for that. If there was truly nothing we can do, but I believe that there are things that we can do. Uh, I think that the benefits, uh, first and foremost, is that many times we identify a treatable condition. It might be you know, low thyroid, it might be a sleep apnea, a sleep problem. That's fairly common as a cause of you know, mid to later life uh, development of memory problems. Uh, might find you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol that otherwise would not have been found and needs to be treated. Um, so very often we can find a condition that would otherwise have been missed or maybe not discovered until a much later stage. Um, people may be encouraged to participate in healthier lifestyle choices. So you can't change what's happened before, but certainly moving forward, if you said, well, yes, a little bit of a memory uh, problem, it might be a motivator to get more engaged in uh, exercise and more uh, cognitive ability, you know, maybe a little more aggressive about treating those other medical problems and following up with them. Uh, there are also symptomatic treatments. So what symptomatic treatments are medications that might improve or boost memory or thinking. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't stop things from sliding down the curve uh, over time, but at least raises you up a little bit higher so that you can function at a better level for longer. And, and that's worth having. Um, indeed, if it looks like someone is actually tipping down a little faster and they're heading towards dementia. That's bad news. Nobody wants to hear that. But if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And if you get that news at an earlier stage, it does also allow us to plan ahead and maybe put in support. So say, you know, okay, we don't have a cure for this disease right now, but we do have things that we can do to help manage it by recognizing the problems early on and getting those safety nets in place. People can focus on living their lives, really focus on better quality uh, without necessarily uh, having to scramble and find extra help every time another crisis happens because the disease will progress. 
So I do think that it is helpful to know at an earlier stage rather than not know. And last but not least, again, research opportunities. We are actively engaged in research to try and find ways to truly slow down or stop this disease. A, a couple of uh, you know, quick points. Common questions I get, I'll try and predict you know, what some of the common questions will exercise help. Uh, and uh, yes, it does seem that exercise, physical activity is very helpful. People, some say, well, you know, I can't do exercise. You know, I've got other you know, heart or lung problems or physical limitations, so I can't do the recommended 30 or 40 minutes three times a week. Well, you know, if you can only do a little bit, you know, even chair exercises, a little bit is better than none. So it's, it is dose dependent. We don't know what the, the best amount would be, but I'd say, you know, at least three times a week uh, of half an hour if you can. And if you can't do that, do what you can do. If all you can do is kind of the sit and be fit exercises, you know, the, the public television had a video sit and be fit a number of years ago. I don't, I don't see it on anymore, but it's actually really good and it's helpful. Uh, and, you know, that can uh, be something that people even with a lot of physical disabilities can try. How does it work? We're not sure, but we believe that, uh, you know, the physical activity releases uh, a chemical into your bloodstream that is good for your brain, helps neurons grow and stay healthy called BDNF. If only we could get that and put it in a pill and get it to go to the right place, <laughs> then we would have exercise in a pill. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> um, I get asked about vitamins. What vitamins or supplements? There's a million vitamins and supplements out there you can take. There's all kinds of companies advertising stuff. And, and maybe some of them actually help a little bit, but most of them, they're advertising that based on very, very little clinical evidence. Um, uh, you know, maybe they've seen something work in an animal, or maybe they gave a free samples to a few people and they said they felt better, and that's enough to say, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're going to market this. Uh, people spend billions on this kind of stuff, you know, all you know, nationwide. So um, I'm going to just talk about the simple and cheap and common stuff where there is some evidence. Uh, where there's the most evidence. Um, vitamin E. Now, we used to be recommending vitamin E to everyone back in the early 2000s. Uh, and then there was a study came out uh, around 2005, said, you know, vitamin E may increase the risk of uh, brain hemorrhages and, and death. And all of a sudden, all doctors are worried, if I recommend vitamin E, I'm going to get sued. Everyone stop their vitamin E. Of course, that study was questionable methods, small numbers. Um, those who still believed in it said, well, you know, this doesn't make biological sense. You know, all these other studies before have sort of been helpful. Admittedly, it's a small help. It's not a big help. Uh, so, I mean, it's not going to really cure Alzheimer's disease. But if thousands and thousands of people took it, you're going to see subtle differences that the people who took it were a little bit more brain healthy than those who didn't. So that's exactly what uh, uh, Dixon and their colleagues did. Uh, for about three to five years, had you know two or three thousand people taking vitamin E supplements. Their dose was two thousand units a day. I don't know if that is the dose to take. A lot of people take eight hundred, um, but there were no observed problems with that dose, and the uh, people who took it were slightly better, statistically significant. Uh, so you know it was probably real. It wasn't it was unlikely just due to chance. But the, the size of the improvement was uh, fairly small. We call the size effect. So you can do big studies and show that lots of things are statistically significant, that they're helpful. But you know, in terms of what you'll notice day to day, vitamin E is not, probably not going to be you know, wonderful. I recommend it because uh, it's cheap, it's easy. How to do it, whether you decide to take vitamin E supplements or eat food, healthy food, varied diet has vitamin E and that's where we get our most of our vitamin E. Fish oils, coconut oil, DHE, uh, you know, uh, flaxseed oil, it's basically the same active ingredient. Uh, back in 2012, uh, Cochrane Review said, you know, the evidence is lacking, so they didn't recommend it. But as time has gone on, more and more studies are showing that uh, omega-3 fish oils related compounds do seem to change some of the biological markers 
that we know are associated with increased risk of dementia later on. So we're not talking about you know dementia, but maybe some of the early warning signs, the early markers, we're able to see that yes, there are some significant changes for the better. Now, why is that important? Another recent study just came out and uh, uh, omega-3 uh, over five years did not uh, show any difference, did not prevent dementia in a large number of thousands of people who were studied. Uh, this is done in France and Lyon. Um, how can these studies say that you know, it seems to be beneficial and the other study looking at dementia didn't. Well, the problem is that it takes decades for the pathology of dementia to develop. I showed you that slide earlier where the amyloid starts in your 40s and you get the tau protein, then you get the uh, MRI changes, then you get the mild cognitive impairment, then you get the dementia. That process takes decades, 30 years. So you'd have to do a 30 year study if that's the endpoint you're looking for. Um, and so I do think it is important to try and look for some of the early changes of uh, risk factors. You know, we know that you know, the um, risk of developing dementia, for example, is associated with the amount of amyloid in your brain, for example. Uh, you know, so if we do a study where we are looking at the amount of amyloid in the brain or changes in the amyloid, you know, we only have to do you know, a, a, a year or five year study Whereas if we're looking for development of dementia, we have to do a 30 year study. So we can start to test some of the treatments and get some information back quickly because, you know, let's face it folks, we're all getting older. We want something now, we don't want to wait. Uh, so omega-3, I, I recommend it. I personally get omega-3 by eating, you know, salmon and boiled fish, but uh, you know, there, there are supplements and things you can buy. Um, this slide is busy, just basically a number of other things that seem to show uh, benefits for some of the biological markers. So, you know, the first one is uh, PET scans of, of brain function showing uh, that folate and beta carotene uh, were good for health. The bottom one is saturated fat. Guess what? That's bad for brain function. Um, the uh, other column here on the right, these are... Uh, uh, compound, you know, what's the association with buildup of the amyloid protein? Turns out vitamin D that seems to be associated with uh, less amyloid protein if you have more vitamin D. Same for vitamin B12, same for omega-3. So it seems like, you know, healthy vitamins seem to be associated with healthy brain. Unhealthy things like saturated fat seem to be associated with, guess what, unhealthy brain. Uh, hardly a surprise. Um, so where are we going with all this? We do have some studies going on right now at Sanders Brown, and um, I'll show you about half of the studies we have going on because some of them are are full. We've recruited everybody that we need into them, and uh, you know, it's basically watch this space. Hopefully, we'll have some answers or new treatments for you soon. Uh, the first one we're looking um, to recruit for folks for is uh, uh, the Alpha study. That's a yeast selenium. It's made by a local company here, Alltech. Uh, you may have heard of, and uh, it's a compound uh, that we believe might improve brain health. Now, you can go out and buy this, uh, if not now, probably sometime soon, and it'll be just like all these other supplements where, you know, there's you know, some reasonable data that it might be helpful, uh, and uh, certainly I, I think it probably will be, but we don't know the size of that effect, how or how exactly it's going to do that. So. Um, to Altex credit, they actually have taken the next step and uh, gone ahead and sponsored a full-on uh, clinical trial to see you know, how, how, how helpful is it going to be. And so the markers of brain health we're looking for in that is spinal fluid. I talked about you know, the amyloid protein normally is supposed to get flushed into the spinal fluid and then the body absorbs it. If it gets stuck in the brain, it's causing Alzheimer's. The best way to measure you know, if it's going to the right place is to do a spinal tap, which is you know, about a 10 minute in office procedure when we do it. Some people go, oh, I know someone who went to the ER and they had to have a spinal tap and, and it was awful. They felt terrible. Very often the reason we're doing a spinal tap in the ER is that someone is having the worst headache of their life. Uh, and so of course it's going to be horrible. Um, when it's done in the office, people often tell me, well, you know, it's 
a little poke in my back, you know, a little pressure and had to get the local anesthetic, but it wasn't that much worse than, you know, many other, you know, basic procedures like a blood draw or a minor dental procedure. Uh, it really takes a lot longer than dental procedures. You don't have to be you know, doing this. Uh, uh, and when you numb up your low back, you know, it's not like getting the side of your face numb. I mean, it, it, it's uh, not something that bothers people too much. Some people will get a headache afterwards, but uh, that's usually mild and, and temporary. Um, but it is uh, really the best way to try and find out if these things are going to work because uh, why do we want to do a spinal tap instead of, you know, doing memory tests? Because we'll get the answer a whole lot sooner and we'll find treatments for this disease a whole lot sooner if we do that. Um, another study we're, we're looking for people in, um, again, both that first study, age greater than 65, but no dementia. Mild memory problems, that's okay. Everyone over 65, if you ask them, will say, well, yeah, I didn't notice some changes, but um, you know, we're, we're not looking for people who are not able to do things anymore because of the memory. Um, the increased study, uh, again, over 65, no dementia, but maybe taking medications that worsen memory or thinking these could be things like, you know, sleeping pills, pain pills, muscle relaxers, some bladder medicines can do that, um, certain antidepressant medicines. So, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for people if you, uh, you are interested in research and might want to screen for that study, you can talk to one of our screeners and see if any uh, of the medicines you're on might be uh, concerning for memory and thinking. There are many big studies that show that being on more of these medicines is associated with a bigger risk for dementia. Now, what we don't know is if uh, I mentioned earlier, people who have developing brain problems very often might have mood problems too, might have more anxiety or depression, so might be getting put on these medicines more or might be in poorer health, might have other conditions, surgeries, might be on pain pills more. And so there are associations of being on these medicines and having a higher risk of dementia. What we don't know is, do these medicines cause a higher risk of dementia? Or is it something else that's you know, uh, causing both? Uh, and that's what we're trying to figure out by uh, you know, doing some PET scans and maybe talking to the pharmacist to reduce exposure to these medicines and see you know, uh, can we help people think better? Uh, being on these medicines, uh, even if they don't cause dementia, can still cause more mental fogginess and memory problems. And so we generally try and find ways uh, to get people on lesser doses or alternative medicines if possible. Uh, we've also got the early study. And this is a trial of a new drug that's to try and reduce the risk of Alzheimer's or you know, prevent Alzheimer's. Uh, people over age of 65, but if you have a family history, like first degree relative, uh, you know, parent or sibling, uh, we'll take folks at a, at a younger age, and that involves again the spinal tap. Uh, that one goes on for five years. Uh, it also has memory tests, so it needs to be a longer study to be able to pick up on those kinds of uh, changes. The exert study, exercise, would anyone like a free membership to the Y and a personal trainer uh, for two years? Uh, basically over 65 normal memory, but the cost is if you have, it's not entirely free, you have to do some memory tests and, uh, and get a couple of spinal taps uh, in the study. So we can find out is it doing what we think it, the exercise might be doing to improve brain health. Uh, there's the AbbVie study. So now uh, we're moving on to people who've got you know mild memory problems. So no longer normal memory, so we try to give something for everyone. The Abbey study is if you are already having memory problems, we want to see if we can slow down or stop that, stop it from getting worse, or you know, keep you up closer on the, the blue line I showed earlier than getting down into the red line. Uh, so that one again is two years, and that also involves a spinal tap and memory tests. Lastly, you know, we don't want to forget our folks who got more significant um, uh, Alzheimer's disease who may be already progressed into the disease. We want to do what we can to help and support them. So the Suvin study, uh, that's a drug that we hope to improve symptoms in uh, more moderate Alzheimer's disease and slow down the disease. That study is over eight months. You know, in the later stages of the disease, it does progress a little more quickly. We're able to see if drugs work or not in a shorter space of time. Uh, and so over eight months, we're looking for basically anyone with moderate uh, stage uh, of dementia. 
uh, so any significant dementia problems, uh, certainly we could um, take a look and see if uh, they might be eligible for that study if you know someone. Uh, in summary, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. You know, good health, exercise, staying active mentally as well as physically, healthy diet, getting adequate sleep, all of these things are associated with reducing risk of dementia, treating medical conditions, blood pressure, cholesterol. You, know, you may feel fine, but there's a reason to you know, take those medicines every day, even though you feel no better or worse, whether you take them or not, because they reduce the risk of other health problems down the road. And uh, you know, we've got uh, ongoing research. Uh, I will give you a number. So for example, if anyone is interested in some of these trials, or perhaps in a free memory screen on the Wednesday and Thursday afternoons. Uh, you could call this number, the area code 859-323-5550. Uh, 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 we can explain you know, what research studies might be a good fit for you, uh, and maybe there might be uh, other opportunities coming in the near future. We can also put you on the mailing list if there isn't something you know, immediately available that would work, but you're interested in knowing what research studies we're doing, what's coming down the pipeline and what's kind of opening up. We can send out a newsletter, we do that quarterly and try and keep uh, anyone who's interested informed. Uh, and then lastly, I want to put in a plug for the Marksbury Symposium. That's a, an international level conference that we have every year here in Lexington. Uh, this year, it's going to be on November 3rd and 4th. Uh, the third is generally a scientific symposium for professionals. Uh, uh, but on the fourth, uh, we have open to public, to family members, to uh, people who may have concerns, basically anyone who's interested. In, and that's usually uh, very well received. That's held down at the Lexington Convention Center. Again, we have some flyers for that at the back of the room. And for anyone who is uh, you know, uh, dialing in and watching this remotely, uh, so you give us a call that number, we can send you an invite. Well, I'll wrap it up with that um, and open up to any questions. Yes? Well, what does a person do, like, I'm in my late 50s, and my mother was recently, I mean, she's been diagnosed with um, not Alzheimer's, but she has to go into an assisted living facility because she couldn't, you know, take care of herself. Right. How do I not freak out every time I get a phone number or get an appointment? That's, I'm like, I mean, what, 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 what can I do besides exercise, stay active, eat healthy, yeah. doing, sleep, doing the modification like, to prevent yeah, things? Yeah. Or, or well, to know if I have something that it doesn't matter how much I do, it's still going to happen. Well, uh, there, there's a couple of things to that. First, I'm, I'm sorry your mom's had this decline. It, it's something which people are. Uh, increasingly becoming familiar with and you know Alzheimer's disease is not just a disease that affects patients themselves it affects everybody around them, it affects family members and it's very stressful dealing with that as I'm sure you know and uh, many you know, relatives children you know, feel quite a, a lot of stress and, and guilt and anxiousness over this happening uh, in their parent or, or other loved one um, that alone can be enough to cause, you know, we have a sort of tongue-in-cheek nickname for it, we call it caregiver dementia or caregiver memory problems. Uh, your, your brain is only capable of processing a finite volume of information. And when you have a lot more things going on, uh, less important things, or even sometimes even important things, and sometimes fall by the wayside. They don't get processed as much as you normally would be able to do. Combine that with maybe some of the mild, subtle changes that happen with normal aging, it can all of a sudden make it look like, oh my goodness, I'm falling apart. Um, we see this a lot, and the vast, vast, vast majority of the time is just what I mentioned there. It's, it's a, a normal reaction or adjustment to what's happening in your life busy stressed out uh, so those things will will happen and they may happen at times when you don't notice it you may think well i'm not really thinking about this I'm not really stressed out about this right now but uh, at, at some level it does change you know your 
alertness levels. There are kind of deeper structures in the brain that get altered by chronic stress or, or by acute stress. And it does change how other parts of the brain process information. It happens to soldiers in battle, um, you know, to take some extremes. You know, people may, you know, have this kind of derealization sensation. Uh, it can lead to people develop the PTSD in extreme circumstances. Chronic stress increases risk of physical illnesses as well. So even though I say, well, it's probably not dementia, it doesn't mean it's not important to think about, well, how am I going to address this? You could take advantage of one of our free memory screens, for example. You could talk with one of our family support specialists um, uh, or, or look at ways to improve your health. Make sure that you're getting some time to process this when you can decompress, when you don't have other things going on. Time to yourself uh, as a caregiver is incredibly important. I can't underemphasize that to anyone who is dealing with a patient with Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, you cannot drive a family car at the Indy 500 at 110 miles an hour all day long and not expect something to break. You know, most people are, are not these superhuman, uh, you know, sports cars, you know, and even those sports cars at the end of a race, they have to be torn down and rebuilt again. You know, to take that analogy a little further, um, people are not capable of giving 110% all the time. You know, we can certainly you know, step up to the plate and do as much as we can for a period of time, but that needs to be balanced with the breaks uh, and uh, maybe distributing the load. So please call us if anyone is experiencing that and needs some advice on, on how to balance things. Yes? Um, I'm wondering if there's anywhere that, or if it's even possible that you can kind of see almost like a progression of the disease like mm. my dad has Lewy body dementia and you know like he's starting to fall out of bed and not recognize what the phone like not know how to use a phone and I mean all of these things so I'm just wondering like you know it's very very difficult for my mom and I'm just wondering yeah how bad is it going to get before. That, that is another great question, and this comes up in you know, every every case we have. You know, uh, everybody's different, but we want to know what's going to happen next. These diseases are, by definition, progressive. They do, unfortunately, get worse over time. And, and although we're doing everything we can to find try to find treatments to alter that change that we're not there yet I hope someday soon we will be but we're not so we kind of have to face this reality that things do progress over time and that's really hard to do um, some people are going to get a lot worse quickly some people are going to really kind of hold on and maybe even the you know, Lewy body disease can go up and down it can even seem to improve for a while uh, I usually tell people okay we're gonna to have to take two approaches at the same time one we hope for the best. You know, we, we hope that, that uh, you know, they'll enjoy the quality of life they have and you know, kind of uh, you know, make sure to recognize their small victories and the, the good times that we do have with them. At the same time, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. We don't want the worst to happen, but it might happen. The thing is, if something does get worse, if something does progress, significantly and we've thought about that possibility and we've made some plans what we're going to do about that if it happens if it does happen rather than being a crisis it is something okay unfortunately we've got to this but we talked about this we planned what to do here's a number i'm going to call or here's you know the next step we're going to take so in, in the situation something getting worse which would ordinarily be a big crisis at least you know what to do next and again our family support specialists uh, Kelly is one who has joined us today um, Robin uh, also works with us can help give you some advice and help you line up a few you know what ifs you know what if this gets worse what do I do who do I call where do I go uh, and it's important to do that but also recognize 
maybe we won't need all of these things. You know, we're not doing it because they're definitely going there. Maybe they won't. You know, maybe they'll kind of level off. I and mean, we do see that people will kind of level off or even improve a little bit um, with good, you know, care of all the other physical side of things. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the back, <laughs> yeah. one more question. Yes. Well, uh, they have a, a cognitive test that they'll give, similar to what I showed you earlier on. Uh, this is called the MMSE, and there's a range of numbers, sort of between uh, scores between 20 and 24, for example, uh, or, or kind of teens to uh, low 20s might be in the moderate range. I don't recall the exact numbers, but we'd administer that test and then see you know, where they fit. And sometimes if they don't fit within a one study, we'd often you know, keep your information and see if there's another study coming up that they would be a good fit for. And I think. Yeah, we have a question um, from online. So she's wanting to know what is required for someone to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's versus other forms of dementia? Okay. So um, we never diagnose these things with 100% certainty. Uh, Alzheimer's is the pathology that causes, I'd say 80% of dementias will have Alzheimer's pathology. We know this because of autopsy studies. I don't recommend people get an autopsy as part of the diagnostic test. <laughs> we diagnose Alzheimer's because it is a condition where we know that you know, before people die, we can trace back in these studies where we follow people for many years, uh, and then have done an autopsy, we know that it starts with memory problems, then begins to involve other areas of thinking and orientation, and tends to get gradually but progressively worse. We diagnose it by listening for that kind of a history, doing some memory testing, maybe doing brain scans, um, where we can see if there's some shrinking in the memory areas of the brain. Uh, and making sure that it's not due to something else. That's also a, a key part. So we, we guess that it's Alzheimer's. We say it's probably Alzheimer's dementia. Now we are able to do some more advanced tests, the spinal taps and PET scans, where we can see if there is indeed Alzheimer's protein built up. We can maybe be a bit more confident that it is indeed true Alzheimer's dementia, but uh, some people do have a lot of Alzheimer's protein in their brain and are just fine. We do see that. So it isn't necessarily a 100% link to dementia. The 80% link, very important. And uh, we know that it's uh, clearly a, a big part of the pathology. But it's not the only thing. There are other kinds of dementias. There's Lewy body dementia where people tend to have more fluctuations, more visual uh, type symptoms, more Parkinson's tends to happen in those patients. There's vascular disease, hardening of the arteries, uh, where people tend to have maybe, they might have stroke symptoms, they might not, they might just have slowing down of their thinking, but a whole lot more than normal cognitive aging. And so uh, if you look at people, say in their 80s, uh, who've been on this planet for a lot longer, who come to autopsy, most of those actually have not one, not two, but three or four different types of dementia pathologies all happening together. So we've got our work cut out for us. You know, if we cure Alzheimer's, that's just the first step. We also need to do it with uh, finding treatments for vascular disease, with finding treatments for Lewy body disease, with finding treatments for the, the tau protein. So it's gonna really take everything together but we can really only test one at a time. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, if you're fine. Yes. Right, I'll, I'll repeat that question. So uh, tell me if this is correct. Um, for patients who need 
access to care and access to services, the quality is generally really good when you get in there, but it's really hard to get in. And the reason for that is that uh, something happened after World War II called the baby boom. <laughs> Uh, and you know there are a lot of people who uh, are of the age now where we're starting to see an uptick in health problems that lead to memory and thinking problems and dementia. So even though each person's individual risk of developing dementia has decreased over years, it's because of this population swelling, many people are living longer uh, into their lives. We're seeing basically an epidemic, a tidal wave increase of patients with dementia uh, that we did not have, you know, in, in the 80s or 70s, you know, it still existed there, but Alzheimer's was thought to be a rare disease uh, as um, late as the 1970s and even by some people in the, in the 80s, believe it or not. Uh, so everybody knows about it now and that's the reason why is people are living longer, plus there's a population swelling in the age of people who are getting it. We have not uh, kept up with um, training uh, and you know the, the politics and the finances of being able to provide those services. So uh, the Alzheimer's Association has been telling people and telling politicians for decades this is coming. And what we've had, the response has been the ostrich head in the sand. Now we're starting to see some increased interest and some increased funding to try and find cures, try and develop services, try and train people. And we've just started a fellowship training program here at, at uh, University of Kentucky, which will give us one additional person as soon as we find someone to fill it. The rate that we're going to bring new people, bring new trained providers into this field is so slow and we're so far behind it's it's going to be a problem and i i don't know what the solution is we're trying to find ways to maybe stretch people a little further maybe take the experts and we're doing a project with ipads where you fall into uh, nursing facilities and maybe give some advice uh, the thing is that still uh, uh, the way we have it a little time consuming and cumbersome we're talking about maybe Go ahead. No, just finish. Yeah. So um, we're trying to build services and look at you know clever ways to do it. You know the uh, management folks always like us to find ways to do more with less. But really, this is a very complicated field. The people who are working in this field, like Kelly and Harden, myself, I, I guarantee you, we're doing as much as we possibly can at the moment and there's not much more. We cannot stretch much more, yet we're only addressing a fraction of the need of uh, what's out there. So what are we gonna do about that? I'm not sure. I think maybe training up more people to kind of help extend more mid-level providers, more education for patients, families, um, primary care doctors, people who are kind of on the front line, maybe move from spending that 90 minutes uh you know evaluating talking to people doing everything that there is to do for a good dementia evaluation maybe that might be better spent um you know spending 10 minutes with uh you know nine different primary care frontline providers to guide them teach them and advise them how to do it you know uh, in in our communities um, yeah, the, the average weight kind of nationwide to get into a, a memory disorder specialist is about eight to 12 months. That, that's not just here, that's everywhere. I find myself testing like 
So the effects of anesthesia and having surgical procedures, patients who have either memory problems or dementia, research has been done. Um, it's not good. I, I mean, getting an anesthesia and a surgery, and it's often not just the anesthesia, but it's all the other things that go along with it. Um, the illness itself uh, generally will cause people to have a dip. Um, most people with memory problems, when they have to go in for an acute surgery, will have a, a dip. Uh, and usually come back out of it once all the other health problems have stabilized. But um, a lot of people tell me, well, they're not quite back at where they were. And uh, for the most part, uh, I believe that's because these conditions do tend to generally slide over time. But sometimes people kind of hang on and kind of maintain as long as nothing upsets the apple cart. But if you put them through a dip like that, they can't quite get back to where they, they were. And that's very, very common. It's not necessarily an indication that the surgery, illness, or medications caused additional brain injury, but certainly you know, interrupted the coping mechanism to the point that they can't quite climb back up that ladder and get to where they were. So it is a risk. Now we've got to balance the risk against what's the benefit. If someone needs a surgery or they're going to die or they're going to be a whole lot more sick, it's a risk that you have to take. When you have these advanced diseases, um, the, the best way to do it is just try and minimize that risk. So we'll talk with the anesthesiologist and say, you know, can we use more peripheral loop nerve blocks and maybe lighter anesthetics and maybe go easy with the pain medicines and uh, you know, keep them comfortable, but sort of watch how they do. But don't give the same dose that you're going to give to an 18-year-old to an 80-year-old. Generally, um, the anesthesiologists and surgical specialties are aware of that and will do that. But um, sometimes we do need to just give them a reminder. So it sounds like they're making, they're having that discussion, the risk and benefit. There's no easy way out of that. Well, we, we do have the study um, for cognitively normal people who are on medications that might impact brain health. So we can learn more about those mechanisms. And I think what we learned from that study might educate us about what happens down the road uh, in those other situations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.